So the data that you see, so this is just a continuation from last time. The data that you see is made up of how many DMEs? You can tell me, how many DMEs are here? Yeah, please, there are six. Six DMUs. How many inputs? How many outputs? So one input, one output. Okay. One input, one output. Now, if you look at this one input, one output, we are going to scatter plot it. And, and scatter plotting it in Excel is a very simple thing. Okay. It's a very simple thing. Sometimes um, students are not able to do. It's a matter of highlighting from number one under staff to number one under sales. Okay. Highlighting and then dragging it all the way down to the last one. Only the numbers. Only the numbers you're highlighting. And I'm going to Excel and doing that scatter plot. Should I do it or you can all do it by yourself? Because in your research, you will all scatter plot your own artificially produced data set. Should I do it or you can do it yourself? Have you all done it? Dinah, please, somebody should be talking for me. Okay, I need to be sure of what, whom I'm talking with. Okay. Other than that, I can choose to go quickly and then ignore you. Okay. Have you all no. done the scatter plot? Yes. Yes, please. Yes. All right. Now, so you are able to do the scatter plot on your own. You put sales on the vertical line. You put staff on the horizontal. Line. Now, the sales are the output. So this is an input-output model. DMU1 is 1-1. One, one. So when you start to do that, you have to label it. And the way you label it, you create a text box and label it and nudge it down it. So you can see that this one is down it. The others are on top of it, on top. What DA does is that DA will create a frontier from those that are on the extreme left extreme top left, we call it the Northwest section. And then we'll join them together. So the DA will draw this piecewise linear envelopment frontier by joining from the extreme left, which is one, to the next one, which is two, to the next one, which is four, to the next one, which is five, five, eight, six. Now, the way he's doing it is it's, it's a graphical approach, but when you use a mathematical approach, it becomes a linear program. We shall look at it. What the DA would do is this. What the DA would do is it will construct that piecewise envelopment model from the data set. And you can see that this was from the data. And then that will create the efficiency frontier, which is a green line that you can see here. Once this is done, and it does this by identifying those efficient best practice firms. You see, the word best practice firms are those firms that are efficient. And they are used to construct the boundary of the frontier. And they will envelop the rest. You can see that. All of the other DMUs, including three and five, have been enveloped. If you look at the way an envelope looks like, when you open the envelope, you see that things are inside the envelope. That's how something like that is looking at. And that is why the technique is known as data envelopment model. That is why the data is known as um, data envelopment analysis. So data envelopment analysis and that is what we are discussing there. So the efficiency of every other firm, including even those that form the frontier, you can measure it relative to the frontier. And that word relative to the frontier is what makes this thing called 
um, relative to the frontier. Now, relative because there is a frontier. So relative here is in comparison with relative because there is a boundary that you are measuring. So you can't say that this guy is short unless you are measuring his height in relation to another person who is tall. That's where relativity comes into the picture. Okay. So that is why efficiency is always called a relative efficiency. And I want you to understand this because as you progress, you come to see that whilst this is good, it's also a weakness. Because if you are measuring all of us in relation to the frontier, um, Daniel, are you the one looking at Syria correlation? Yes, Doc. So you can see that there's a bit of autocorrelation or serial correlation there. Because what, what is happening, or the, what we call dependency problem in regression. One of the things of regression is that the independent variables, see they are called independent variables because they are said to be uncorrelated with the dependent variable, with the other independent variables. So in a regression, when the independent variables are highly correlated with the dependent variable, then you have the problem of what? Who can remember? Autocorrelation. You have multicollinearity. <laughs> you have multicollinearity. It happens when the independent variables are highly correlated with other independent variables. So they are close. Okay. Now, that dependency, we don't want it. We don't want them to be, you know, dependent on each other. And so, but if you look at the DA structure, there is a dependency. So the efficiency of DMU3 is dependent on the boundary, which was created by DMU1, 2, 4, 6. It's dependent. So there is a dependency issue here. A serial kind of correlation. Of course, the serial correlation will deal with the errors associated with this um, individual variables. And this will later be one of the issues in DA. Okay, now the distance is measured in an input-oriented direction or in an output-oriented direction. So look at, look at the, you all see the shaded region. You see the shaded region. Yes, uh, if you look at the shaded region, is the line also part of the shaded region? Is the line, those of you who type, I will, I will suggest that you should stop because um, um, I don't normally look at these typings and all of that. It's better for somebody to respond than to type, okay? The shaded region. If you look at the shaded region, it also includes the line. So both the line and the shaded below the line is what is called the technology set. Keep that in mind. You will come to later on how to define that properly. Okay. The line, that is a frontier line, the efficiency frontier, plus the space below the efficiency frontier. These two are called the technology set. So the technology set is not made up of only the shaded, but also the line itself. Okay, so let's talk note of that very important point. Very, very important point. Okay, so I want you to look at the thing again. Which DMUs are efficient? Yes, you can type because some of you look like you love typing. That is the only language you can speak. So let's go with it. DMU 1, 2, 4, and 6. Okay. So you have one, two, four, and six. Which ones are inefficient? Tell me. MDMU three and five. Okay. Now, which DMUs are dominated? Which DMUs are dominated? Who are Derek? Hello, Doc. Don't dock me, don't worry. I've asked, called your name already, so you don't need to dock me. Okay. I said, which DMUs are dominated? Um, DMU three and five. Okay. And which DMUs are undominated? Yeah. 
Um, DME is one, two, four, and six. Okay. I hope you understand the words I'm using before you answer them. Okay. Now, what should an inefficient DMU do to become an efficient DMU? So if you look at the inefficient DMU three, DMU five, what should they do to become efficient? What should they do? Edwin. What should they do to become efficient? I'll take one of them and tell me what it has to do to become efficient. Um, okay, so for DMU3, I think it can improve is it, it can improve the um uh, doc please I don't really know. Okay. Imanal I do what should the inefficient DMU do to become efficient? Uh, for DMU3, I'm thinking they can increase their staff so that to increase their sales so that they can find themselves on the same frontier. How do you increase staff? Look at staff. DMU3, staff is four. So if you are increasing staff, you are going to the right. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Stop. Yeah, I see what you're okay, saying. Okay, so stop. Don't guess again, okay? We are trying to get a yeah, right. Okay. But you can see that when you have four, four staff, okay, you don't have to increase the staff to become efficient. Diana, help them. Okay, so, so for instance, DMU3, we would say that it has to reduce the number of staff from four to the point on the frontier to become efficient. Well, and what is that point on the frontier? Um, that's about 1.5. Okay. So yeah. the direction, what direction is that? But it has to move to the left. What orientation is that? That's what I'm asking. Inputs. Why? Because the concentration here is on reducing the inputs whilst maintaining the level of output there. No, the concentration is simply because you said they should reduce that and that is an input. You are making a okay. simple Point. You said we should reduce staff, and staff is an input. So the direction is an input-oriented direction. Okay, Doc. Now go ahead with the second point. Okay, so then the second point would also be to increase um, sales. So it can increase sales from its current position. Okay. So if, if you all look at DMU3 here, mm -hmm. when, when my Kessa is circling around it, do you guys see? Yes, please. Yes, dog. Yes, so dog. If you look at DMU3, if it goes upward, the whole idea for it to be efficient is to hit the boundary of the frontier, that green line. It can move leftward to hit the boundary at this point, which means staff will be going down from 4 to 1.5. Now, for you, right? You read it down. Now, when it hits the frontier here, you read it down, and that comes to 1.5. That will make it efficient if the focus is on input reduction. But if the focus is on output augmentation, output increase, then DMU3 will have to move from here, go upward, vertical, until it hit the boundary of the frontier. Now, where it will hit the boundary here, you have to read it on the output line, okay? And where you hit the boundary here will be something like 4.3 there, 4.3 there, 4.3 there. Okay. And that becomes the output. So these are the two means by which this firm can be efficient. Or there are other orientation. For example, if it tries to go diagonal, it also hits the frontier. If it tries to curve diagonal, it will also hit the front So, how do you then measure the efficiency of DMU3, where it is standing now? Well, it's simple. This is how you measure efficiency of any firm. And keep this in mind, that efficiency of any firm is measured and the efficiency score is defined by theta. The J is referring to any of the DMUs. 
the theta is the score of efficiency. And that score is the distance from the origin to the frontier and the distance from the origin to the fan. The distance from the origin to the frontier divided by the distance from the origin to the fan. So I'll give you an example. If I want to measure the output oriented distance for DME3, the distance from the origin to the frontier, you see where it is, it will be moving from the origin. The origin is at two, but we normally read it on the horizontal line. Okay, so zero to so when I draw a line from two to where DME3 is, it will cut the frontier somewhere there. Somewhere there. Let me see if I can show you that here. Okay, so look at the distance is the origin from the origin to the frontier is where this number zero is. You read it always at the bottom. To where the frontier is, which is one point. And then the origin to the fan. So it's from zero to four. So it will be 1.5 divided by four. 1.5 divided by four. Do you all get it? It's important yes, no. you master how to measure the efficiency. So if you look at the efficiency of DME5, the same way, input orientation. We are, we are doing the input oriented version first. It's the distance from the origin to the frontier here, which is like three point something. And then from the origin to the fan, which is like six. So the efficiency score becomes that three point something divided by six. Now, let's go to, if you were to estimate this efficiency. So please know that theta is representing input-oriented efficiency score. The Greek letter theta is input-oriented efficiency score. And then, the output-oriented is represented by five Greek letter in the chat here. So the output oriented technical efficiency score is five. And the input oriented technical efficiency score is theta. You gotta know all of this because if you later on realize that you are doing input oriented or output oriented, your letter you will use has to be consistent. Your letter has to be consistent. So when we talk about input oriented score, Okay. We are talking about the percentage by which all the inputs can be reduced. Look at that word carefully. The percentage by which you can reduce all the inputs without touching the output. And the output oriented score is also the percentage of reducing all the outputs. Or the percent of increasing all the outputs without touching the input. Look at where we measure the score. This is very, very important. I want you to know that that the input-oriented efficiency score is between zero and one, and it should never be zero. Zero and one. That's why the, the less than sign has no equal to bit. But then the greater sign, the other less than sign has an equal to bit. So it should be between zero and one, one inclusive, but zero exclusive. Okay. And then the output-oriented score, which is phi, the Greek letter phi, has to be equal to one or more. In all cases, when it's equal to one, the firm is efficient. When it is less than one in input orientation, it means that firm is inefficient. When it is greater than one in the output oriented section, it is less, it's, um, it's inefficient, the firm is inefficient. You get it. Are you all clear? You all clear with it? Okay. Yes, sir. So this is how you estimate. So on the right side, you can see that I'm trying to estimate efficiency score of DMU5. Look at the input directional score. Okay. I calculated it as the distance from the origin to the fan, the origin to the frontier, which gives the fan the score of 3.5. So on the on the chart here, you see 3.5. So DMU5 will have to reduce the input from six all the way to 
3.5 for it to be efficient. For it to be efficient. And so the efficiency, the current efficiency score can be estimated as 3.5 divided by 6, which will give you 0.583. And in this case, is the firm efficient or inefficient? Is it inefficient? inefficient. It's inefficient. Okay. In this case, the firm is inefficient. And the inefficiency of this firm has been calculated. The inefficiency of this firm has been calculated. So what it means is that based on this principle, you can calculate the efficiency and the inefficiency of every firm. And that is the beauty of that. You see, remember, we are not just calculating the efficiency of the firm, but we are also indicating how far the firm should do, go to become efficient. Okay. So in the case of DMU5, we are telling it that you should reduce the input. So you talk, this is what sometimes happens in companies where they will do a lot of redeployment, retrenchment, firing, and hiring, because the system requires that some workers will have to be reduced. And you can use the same principle to calculate the input inefficiency or input efficiency of DMU3. Now, what about output? You can see the same way here. If we choose the world of output, watch the way you read the output. Okay? If you look at DME3, okay, it is that this always keep that in mind. Output orientation, I told you that the figure is going to be more than one or equal to one. So it is a distance from the origin here to the frontier, which is 4.3, divided by the distance from the origin here to where the fan is, which is like two. So the value will be something like 4.3 divided by two. And you can see here in the red writings that you have 4.3 divided by two, which will give you what? It will give you something like 2.167. 2.167. One six seven. Okay, that is what it has to be, and that two point one six seven is the exact score output oriented output oriented efficiency score. That is what it is. An output oriented efficiency score. But the thing about DA is that you can take the reciprocal. You can take the reciprocal of the score. At its most efficient level. Good. So you always, I mean, this is not in all cases. You try to take the efficient, normally when you're dealing with bigger, bigger information, that's why you do that. You, you take the reciprocal of the score so that everything will be between zero and one because you know that when it is between zero and one, then you know that below is efficient, equal to one is, below is inefficient, equal to one is sufficient. It, it just makes for an easy interpretation. But what it does is that it doesn't help you to also, to also identify the target. Because when you actually use the greater than one, that helps you to know what the firm will have to do to become efficient. That tells you what the firm will have to do to become efficient. So if you look at the score of 2.167, which is, we have down here, it just tells you that to be efficient, move your output from two. Look at DME3. That's why you are multiplying the two by the 2.167. Move your output from two to the frontier to be efficient. Now, so why should you go to the frontier? Where should you go? Well, the way to go is what the 2.167 efficiency score will tell you. So if you multiply that by the current level, you will get to the target level. So it helps you to know the exact target okay, of where you want to go. And that is the beauty of that. But for general you know, measurement, general industry analysis, the score when it is between zero and one, it is, it is good to just use that to indicate that a firm is efficient, a firm is inefficient, a firm is efficient, a firm is inefficient. That's all. All right.
So I want you to look at this thing. This is the input-oriented technical efficiency. The one I showed you was an input-input. Input-input. Sorry, sorry. The one I showed you was an input-output. So if you look at this graph here, you have the staff, which is output. You have the sales. You have the staff, which is input. And you have the sales, which is output. Okay. Now, this is one graph you may have to draw. Another graph you may have to draw is where you have the input on the x-axis. So here you have input x1, input x2 on the y. This is another graph you score. So that means that the data you are going to select, the hypothetical data you're going to assume will have to be different. From this one. And these are the different kinds of things we are talking about. Now, there's a final one, which is output-oriented graph. So in that case, you want to draw only two outputs. Output, output. And that is output-oriented graph. You have, you have output here on the y-axis, y2. You have output here on the x-axis, which is um, y1. And then you are able to draw. So you should learn how to draw all of these things. You should. You should, because the time will come during your methodology, you have to draw these things. So you should. You should. Don't underestimate it. Go and create your own. And sometimes you have to create your own, delete the numbers, because when you draw it, the numbers don't match well. The graph looks very bad. So you got to do it again, change the number from two to five, five to the, and then everything will merge very well so that you can draw a beautiful frontier. And please, when you are drawing, don't draw things like what you see here. Just one piecewise, another piecewise, a third piecewise. So that you have only three piecewise. Sometimes you have to do six, one piecewise, two piecewise, three piecewise, four piecewise, five piecewise, six piecewise. So that it becomes plenty piece, piece, piece. That is how it has to be. And that is how it has to be. Okay. Now let's go to the advantages of DE. Why would someone so, use? Yes. Please, I have a question. Um, does it mean that? All the time when we are choosing this, we have to only choose two, two input or two outputs for the graph. Because or the words that we have input. more than two. Come again. Or one input, one output. The one I did first. Okay. Yes. So when you choose two inputs, it means that you are assuming that the output is one, 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 one. Normalized. When you choose two outputs, you're assuming that the inputs are one, 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 one. You get it? Yes, Doc. Uh -huh. Dana, you asked a question. Are you clear now? Yes, Doc. I'm okay. other question so far. It's very important to understand this. You know what some of you are doing? You think that when you go get the slides, you will be able to understand. So you are, you are relaxing in making notes and you are relaxing in asking questions. I remember sometimes you still go and read a graph and you still be a little bit confused, you know, so it's important that you're able to ask questions. That even helps you to better understand it. Okay. The next thing is the advantages of DEA, data envelopment analysis. In fact, if you are choosing this methodology for any work, you have to tell the, the panel why you are using DEA. Every time in your thesis, you have to indicate the advantages of DA. If you copy paste the same thing I'm showing you here, you will fail. So you have to understand every point and write them in your own language and also do references. You can see that even though it is PowerPoint presentation, I'm giving a lot of references in my point I'm saying. So we can't talk without giving references. Okay, the first thing why we do the analysis is because it's able to handle multiple inputs and multiple outputs simultaneously. Because the inputs and outputs are plenty in real life. And the last time we indicated that the SFA does not effectively, or the parametric analysis do not effectively analyze, handle multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Of course, there are new developments where they are able to do that. Okay. So that is one advantage of DEA. The other advantage is that you don't have to specify restrictive functional forms. For example, in stochastic frontier analysis, 
you have to assume a functional form of the production frontier, of the cost frontier, or the profit frontier. You have to assume it. So you can use, a, in fact, you have to assume the functional form, whether it's a production function, whether it's a constant elasticity of substitution function, whether it is a cost, and you are dealing with transcendental logarithmic function. Sometimes you call it translog function. Okay. And then once you have assumed the function, you have to test for homogeneity of the function. You have to also determine the, 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 the error term. Well, you know, in parametric analysis, you have the error term and determine the, the structure of the error term, whether it's normally distributed, truncated, normally distributed, gamma distributed, Weibu distributed, you know, half normal distributed, all kinds of these. You have to really, really, really be clear about how, you know, you, you do it. You have to really, really be clear about it. And that is critical. That is critical. But in the DE analysis, you don't have to do all of this, okay? So that's the next important thing. The second third thing is that you can decompose efficiency. I mean, one of you is doing profit efficiency. So you can decompose the profit efficiency into cost and revenue efficiency. You can decompose the cost efficiency into technical and locative efficiency. You can decompose the technical efficiency into pure technical and scale efficiency. And then you can have scope economies and all. There are several decompositions. <clears throat> that one can do as far as this is concerned. Yeah. So that's very good. Another thing about DEA is that it's unit invariant. Okay. So you can have money. Okay. If you look at accounting and you are dealing with money, all of them will have to be in monetary terms. So the unit of measurement is in monetary terms. But here you can have dollars, you can have the number of, you can have the kilograms of something, the square yards of something, the square kilometers of something. You can have different units of measurement. And this sort of unit invariancy discussed by Pastor and his team is very, very useful. And of course, you can also use it for target setting. I told you about a target. You can identify the peers of the inefficient firms. And then you can, you can find uh, role models for the inefficient firms for them to copy. All of these are advantages. And of course, there are some couple of disadvantages which have been improved now, so they don't seem like disadvantages necessarily like that. Now, what we need is this. You need certain assumptions, assumptions. Assumptions are certain things that must be in place. definition of axioms or assumptions. Certain things that must be in place. Yes, Edwin. And um, Doc, please, for the first merit, you said it's able to handle multiple X and Y. But from the example- the Multiple inputs and outputs. Yeah, multiple inputs, sorry, multiple inputs and outputs. But from the example we saw, it was only able to handle two at a time. So- there And that was because we were doing graph. Okay. Real life, I, we don't do graph. We do multiple inputs. I'm talking about real life, not graphical life. Okay. 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 Thank if you. I were to draw 3D diagram, you'll find it confusing following. So I have to do 2D okay. diagram just for you to understand. It doesn't mean that I cannot handle that. Okay. Okay. All right. So the first assumption is, and you have to note the word and remember it consistently, monotonicity or strong free disposability of input. Each assumption, you got to understand it. Okay? Because the more you understand assumptions, the more you're able to expand the, the theory and develop more PhD about topics. DMUs will have to use more input and produce less output than observed. Now look at the word carefully. What that means is that the strong, and you've got to understand this because if you don't understand this, you have to ask. That 
doing efficiency analysis, you are not looking for firms that are efficient. I want to repeat that. Efficiency analysis does not mean that you are looking for firms that are efficient. You have to expect that some firms will be inefficient. You have to. You have to. You have to expect that some of the firms will be inefficient. What does that mean? It means that you have to expect that some of the firms will be using more input. Now, already you should know that to be efficient, you should be using less input, less input. But that doesn't mean that everybody should be using less input. You have to expect that some of the firms will be using more input. You have to. You have to. And because you have to expect that, it means that you are allowing the firms, the DMUs, to freely dispose of. And when a firm is using more output, when it's supposed to use less output, sorry, when a firm is using more input, when it's supposed to use less input, that firm is inefficient. So you're allowing inefficiency to be existing. So inefficiency is allowed. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be efficient. And this is known as free, strong free disposability. Do you get it? Yes, Doc. Next thing is convexity. The convexity assumption says, it's a very simple point, but a very powerful one. It says that when two points are efficient, a linear combination of them is also efficient or feasible. I'm going to demonstrate this for you to see. Okay. So look on the screen. So I'm going to draw this kind of Cartesian sort of plane, X and Y graph. And then I show you something here, which is a fan. This fan is feasible. This fan is also feasible. When I say feasible, I mean I can find its input and I can find its output. This one too, I know I can find its input and I can find its output. Another firm here is also feasible. Now the convexity assumption says that since firm A is feasible, firm B is feasible, firm C is feasible, there are imaginary firms in between A, B, and C that should also be what? Feasible, possible, producible. So I can join this point A to point B and then join point B to point C and join point C to point A backward and everything within that perimeter is also feasible. That is a convexity assumption. Sometimes it is known as a variable returns to scale assumption. We shall look deeply on that. So everything, as long as, so in short, what it means is that if point A is possible to achieve and point B is possible to achieve, then everything in between them is also possible to achieve. Does that make sense? Yes. If I can travel from here to Kumasi, if Accra is ex existing, all right? And if Kumasi is also existing, feasible, possible, there, then in between Accra, every other city is also what? Existing. Does that make sense? Yes, though. It should make sense. And that is a principle of conversity. Then there's another principle which is known as no free lunch. Of course, you cannot get an output if you are not putting any input. That's what it means. There's nothing called free lunch. You can't get an output when there is no input. So for you to be able to produce something, you must put in something. Use it even in normal languages. The next assumption is a return to scale. Sometimes it's called homogeneity. You can rescale. Rescaling is possible. What it means is that if you raise the input, something must happen to the output. There are possibilities. Now, if something is happening to the output the same way, it is called ray unboundedness. Okay. It's called ray unboundedness or full proportionality. Victor Podinovsky will tell you that 
It is unboundedness or full proportionality. However, if you raise the input and the output can rise, can fall or can remain the same, it is not full proportionality, but it is kind of partial proportionality or kind of, you know, variable retention scale. So variable retention scale is where whatever happens to the input do not necessarily happen to the output. But constant retention scale is where whatever happens to the input, the same percentage is what happens to the output. That is an assumption of retention scale. And this return scale, you got to make it such an assumption before you start an analysis. Then you have additivity. Now, this thing is very difficult to apply. Even though some authors have applied it, additivity simply means that you can sum some of the feasible point. So point A and point B, we can sum them. Okay, Very hard assume to work with. But um, this is a possibility of some of the assumptions. Then you have the final one, which is a minimum extrapolation symptom. According to Tanasoli's 2001 and 2011, okay, what, the minimum extrapolation principle tells you that all the other assumptions we have said already, if you put them together, they should help you now draw the production possibility set. They should help you now to develop the frontier. So that one is kind of encapsulated kind of action that captures everything and put all of them together to make them. Okay, so at this stage, what I want to do now is to define, this is where mathematics come into play. And you've got to master this. Some of these things I'm giving you will probably be the same thing you write in your methodology. So we are going to assume a technology set. Are you ready? Look at that letter I am using to assume this technology set. Who can tell me the Greek letter for this technology set? What is the name of that Greek symbol? That Greek symbol is called Psi, P-S-I. Psi. P-S-I. That is the name of that Greek symbol. Okay, so please take note of that. P-S-I, Psi. So assume this side, PSI. If you don't take it, you say PSI. It's not PSI. That is the technology set. Assume this technology set where N, N is the total number of firms. N firms produce S non-negative outputs. And this is the same thing you will say to develop your model. So you can see that the outputs are non-negative. So you can have an output which is a possible zero, okay, but non-negative output. And the way you write a non-negative output is that the output is represented by Y and it is a member of positive real alternates. So that's how you write. Y is a member of positive real numbers. And these outputs are using these fans are producing this output S, the total output S, using the total number of inputs M. So the total number of non-negative inputs are M. And one of the input is X. So, so, so the key point is that X can produce Y. So if you look at the way I've written it mathematically, okay, the technology set is such that, okay, a particular DMU is possible in the technology set, which is, and is having positive and positive input and outputs, where the input can produce the output. This is how you write it, the production possibility set. It's also called the technology set. It's also called the, the input or output requirement set. So this is the technology set. This is mathematics now. this, you have to now explain the definition of efficiency. We are not moving towards the real definition, the mathematical definition of efficiency. What is efficiency? In simple language, efficiency is output over input, y over x. And what do you do to maximize that efficiency? How do you raise the y over the x? One 
thing you can do is that if you want to raise the ratio, you can either reduce the X, which is the input, or you can increase the Y, which is the output. Then that will raise efficiency. This definition is automatically assuming that there is constant returns to scale. That's automatic. But in real life, you can't have one input and one output. So how can we measure efficiency properly? Because we've already said that everything is complex. Life, you have multiple inputs and output. Well, in such complex situation, you can rather weight the input. When you say weight, you can attach importance to the input and attach importance to the output. So we can say that the efficiency now is not just output over input, but weighted output over weighted input. This is how it is. Okay. Weighted output over weighted input. And that means that we need to know what the weights are. So efficiency here is defined as output one plus output two plus output three, all the way up to output Ys. Now pay attention because some people don't like mathematics. They might feel that this is sometimes a little bit complex, but it's not. It's very simple. Focus. I can add the output one to output two to output three. I am, I am adding the output, but look at the definition. It's not just sum of outputs. It is weighted sum of output. So each of the outputs have has to be weighted. We got weight the y1 with a weight called u1. We got to weight y2 with a weight called mu2. And on and on. And then this is divided by the input. So we got to weight x1 with v1, weight x2 with v2, all the way out to the total number of input, which is M. What are the weights? Well, the weights are the importance attached to each variable. So if you're doing banking efficiency analysis and you have deposit as an input, you have capital as an input, you have labor as an input, they will fill in the bottom line. Okay? So you have V1, D1 for capital, V2, maybe C2 for, oh, sorry, V1, D1 for deposit, V2, C2 for capital, V3, L3 for labor. So you wait. The weights are attached to the input or attached to the output. They're important. We can let the fans choose their own weight. The DA does that. The technology allows each firm to select their own weight. So, FM DME one will select its own weights. And some of them will say that I don't want to put any importance, any weight on X1. So it means that V1 will be zero. Another will say that I don't want to put any weight on X2. I don't think that input X2 is important to me. So I'll give it a value of V2. Remember the weights are in percentages. They are between zero and one. But another will say that I'll put all my weight on labor. So you see that V3 will be one. If each of the firms are being allowed to maximize the efficiency ratio, and if each of them is being allowed to select the weight he wants, then we have given them every chance of looking good. What this means is that the managers of those firms cannot complain that it's not fair that they are efficient. Uh, they are inefficient. I'm going to repeat this point because if you don't take care, you will not know it. So let's assume that you have FEM A and FEM B. FEM A is being allowed by the system to select its own weight for the input and the output. FEM B is also being allowed to select its own weight. In other words, each one of them is being allowed to select the importance they will give to any particular variable. If you have been allowed, to do that, then you can't go and sit somewhere and complain that, oh, I am inefficient by 70% and that's, that's not my fault. That's not my fault because you gave me the weight because you, do, you didn't give them the weight. So the choice of freedom, freedom of choice that DMUs have in selecting their own weight makes the system of DEA very, very beautiful. It makes no manager complain. The input and the output weights 
How do you get them? Well, you get them when you formulate the linear programming problem. And we are going to learn how to formulate the linear programming problem. How? What I'm about to show you is a little bit complex. This is the linear programming problem. Don't look on the right side. Just focus on the red number. Are you guys here? Are you guys there? Yes, yes Doc. Yes, Doc. What I'm about to formulate is not a linear program. It's a nonlinear program. Why? Doc. Fraction. Doc. Yes. Doc, please. please. I have a question on the previous slide. Go ahead. And please, if you allow each manager to select different tweets, how will it, how will the your result be comparable? Since everybody is choosing different tweets, is it will it be fair to compare the results? Yes, it, it's not because everybody once you have once you have selected your weight, you are all being measured relative to the frontier. You are all being given the same measuring rod. Because remember, the efficiency score that you are getting is in relation to your distance to the frontier. It's in relation to how far you are from the frontier. Because in natural science, firms will have firms will have different, different numbers anyway. Some firms will have 40 workers, another will have 20 workers. So you can't prevent that. And he is telling you that these my 20 workers, okay, they are not as important to me as my 20 computers. My 20 robotic computers are better than my 20 workers. Then another person is saying that my 20 are also better than a fine. Okay, you say yours is fine. Okay, for you, yours. Okay, so we are all going to now be measured. We are all now going to be measured as we relate to the frontier. And so once we are measured relative to the frontier and you, you are found out to be bad, you don't have to complain because you selected your own input. So it's not the, the weight you are touching that makes comparability possible. No. It is the frontier that all of us are measured against that makes comparability, comparison possible. Yes, please. Thank you very much. All right. So I want you to look at this nonlinear program. In fact, it's the same thing I gave you earlier. Remember, it's a weighted output divided by the weighted input. You see that? Weighted output divided by the... Now watch carefully and you notice something. You will see that it was supposed to be... Look up here. It was supposed to be the Y1 plus Y2 plus Y3 all the way to the end divided by x1, but we said we should wait it. We should wait the output and we should wait it. So when you do the waiting, you have u1, y1, u2, y2, u3, y3. And so all the u's, I'm going to represent them from one all the way to the end. I'm going to represent each of the u's by r. So that is how come you have ur. So you have ur and then output. So I've summed them. That's why you see the summation sign. So the summation sign, the inputs are from one all the way to S. And the outputs are from one all the way to M. So this makes this whole thing the weighted sum of the outputs divided by the weighted sum of the inputs. And what are we doing with that? Well, that is what we defined as efficiency. And what are we doing with that ratio? We are maximizing it. We are maximizing it. We are maximizing it. And then our goal is to find the weight. Our goal is to find the weight, the weight. And then we are maximizing it by representing it by the letter H naught. In fact, we could have represented it by the letter, um, 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 what do you call it? Uh, the letter, uh, um, five. No, no, the theta, the letter theta. You know, theta is for the input orientation, the letter is for the input orientation. And that's the, that's the, we could have, we could have just.
just use that. But we are not doing that, you know, for this purpose. Okay, so this is efficiency. The efficiency is maximizing the weighted output over the input. But of course, it's always subject to some constraints. And remember, we are talking about linear programming. Linear programming is where you maximize an objective function subject to certain constraints. Do you remember? Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. So in this context, our objective function is efficiency score here. This efficiency, the weighted output over the weighted input, is our objective. Subject to this constraint. What is a constraint? A simple constraint which says that the same weighted output over the weighted input should not be more than one. Should not be more than one. What does this mean? In other words, if I should apply the weight and watch carefully, eh, look at the last letter here. The last letter here is zero, which is for the target firm. So I am, I am trying to find the efficiency of a target firm. Let's say the target firm is DMU1. So I'm finding the efficiency of DME1, which is a weighted output over the weighted input. The zero, zero at the end shows is a target from a particular firm. But this second constraint here, this constraint is saying that if I should apply the same weight I gave to this target firm, if I should apply the same weight to all the other firms, how do we know that? All the other firms are represented by J. So the only difference between the top ratio and that this one in the constraint is the J and then that zero. So if I should apply the same way to all the other firms, including the firm that you analyze as the target, because if it, the target firm is firm one and all other firms, all those firms, it will include firm one as well. That is why the J is from one all the way to N. It's from one all the way to the total number of firms. So the rule is that if I should apply the same weight to all other firms, then there should not be more than a user-specific value of one. In other words, no firm should be more than 100% efficient. No firm, no firm, no firm should be more than 100% efficient if the same weight are applied to each of the firms. And the weight must be positive. That is a, one of the other constraints. This is the usual non-negativity constraint you all know in linear programming. Do you remember that non-negativity constraint? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is a non-negativity constraint. Okay. The UR and the VI should be greater or equal to zero. It's a non-negativity constraint. And of course, the inputs are from one to M and the outputs are from one to S. This VI means for every I, where i is 1 to m for every i where i is from 1 to m and then for every r where r is from 1 to s this is a nonlinear fractional programming model now this model is more or less in terms of input orientation but we can do the same thing in terms of output orientation okay in terms of output, that's why you see the other one on the right hand side here. Now, what is the one on the right side? Instead of maximum, we are talking about minimum. Okay, so instead of maximizing, we are talking about minimizing. And instead of the weighted output over the weighted input, we are rather talking about the weighted input over the weighted output. And if you look at the subject to constraint, instead of less than or equal to one, we are having greater than or equal to one. So those are the only difference between the input oriented and output oriented in a fractional programming problem. Now, of course, you know that working with fractions is more of a, a problem than working with linear. So we have to convert this fractional programming problem to a linear programming problem. Now, in case you may have forgotten how to do such comparison, let me just remind you of something you already know. Let me just remind you or something. Do you remember this thing we call um, a Cobb Douglas production function? It's like this. Cobb Douglas production function, K alpha, and then oh, um, LD. Have you seen something like this? Have you seen something like this before? 
Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Yes. Yes. So you can, you can see that the A is multiplying the K, the K is multiplying the L. And the K is to the exponential number, and, and L is to the power beta. Now, this is a quadratic equation. Uh, this is a quadratic something. So we can find a way around this. Okay. We can now convert it into a linear program, or we can linearize it. And one way of linearizing is it's taking the length. So you have length Q equals to okay, A, okay, length, oh, A alpha length K plus beta length L. Do you remember something like this? Yes. yes so what, what I'm doing, what you're doing is that you are linearizing it. And it's the same principle here. Okay? We are linearizing, we're going to linearize this fraction into a linear line. So that everything becomes a kind of a straight line. But first, what the fraction says is what I've told you already. It says that efficiency is a maximum of a ratio of the weighted output to the weighted input, subject to the condition that similar ratios for every firm must be less than or equal to 100% when the same values of the weight apply to each unit. This is what and if there were no subject to constraint, if there were no this subject to constraint, what will happen? Well, then nothing prevents the DMU from choosing any weight he likes. And that's the ratio becomes so big and so large. Okay? So we are limiting the higher the number of ratio. Um, the values to be up to one. So DMUs can only choose weights such that no DMU have an efficiency score greater than one with those weights. Now, so this is a linearization. We linearize the fractional programming problem by normalizing it. In the input-oriented multiplier fractional programming problem, the one you saw above, we call it input-oriented multiplier problem. Okay. It can be linearized by normalizing the weighted input. Now watch the word. Input oriented, you normalize the weighted input. When you normalize the weighted input, what it means is that, go to the thing. You see that the weighted input is a VI SI naught. The VI SI naught. You are normalizing that. So what that means is that you are changing that value and set it to one. And you minimize the numerator, the very simple thing. So you now go and give the maximize the numerator, and then you go and add the denominator, which is a vi xi. You will now go and equate that one to one. That is the one you are whatever you are normalizing, the one you equate to one is what is known as the input orientation. So if if I equate the input to one, if I equate the input to one, then I am doing input orientation. If I equate the output to one, then I am doing output orientation. And that is what the second bullet actually tells you. Now, why are we normalizing? It's simple to convert the whole thing from fractional problem to a linear problem. That's all. Fractional problem to linear. So watch this carefully. You're going to normalize this. Now, the way I'm going to write it is this. I'm going to say that efficiency is maximizing the ratio, the, the UR, YR, zero. That's it. I will not bring divided by the, this. One. Then I will now bring this value here, bring it down to come and join the constraint and set it equal to one. That's all. Watch it. So this is where I've set it equal to one. I've set it equal to one. And now I am now going to minimize the H here. And then, what did I do? It looks like I'm rather using output oriented. Okay. So this one that I'm doing is rather output oriented. So I like to change it. Sometimes I like to change it so that at least it doesn't become. So it was input oriented. That's why we saw maximize. And now I want to use this one in the box here. One in the box here. I want to now convert the one in the box here to a linear programming. So that means I will have minimized the numerator. Then I will set the denominator, which is the output, weighted output. I'll set 
that one to one. And this one, I'll just cross multiply. So that I'll move the denominator here to the, to multiply the one there and then bring it back inside. So that it becomes a weighted VI XIJ minus weighted UR YRJ. Remember you cross multiply and then move it from the right hand side and bring it to the left hand side. This is what you have. This is the one I move it from the right hand side and then bring it to the left hand side. And then and this W, we shall talk about it, okay? Under constant returns to scale, then W is zero. And under variable returns to scale, W is not zero. And then you have the non-negativity constraint and all the other definitions. Now, this simple, this simple fact that we have the weighted output have been set to one, means that we are doing output orientation. And like I said, any time you set any one of them to one, you get an output orientation. So we have been able to define efficiency as an output over the input. Then we said that no, single output, single output, single output, single input is not good. So we now went into multiple. So we define efficiency as a multiple output over multiple inputs. And then we said, no, we need to wait the output because you can't just add Y1 to Y2 like that. You have to wait them. So we have, weighted sum of output over the weighted sum of input. We saw that it was a fractional model, so we need to convert it to a linear model by normalizing it, which you have just done. This whole thing is called a multiplier model. The multiplier model. The next time we are going to learn how to now move from the multiplier model into a duality concept, we shall look at the envelopment model which will now set the stage for us to be using the envelopment model throughout. Because in real life situation, the, the multiplier model that we've just shown right here is not too much used. It's not too much applied and it's not too much. But the envelopment model. For those of you who have done linear programming properly, you will know that there's something we call duality. Any primal model will have its dual. And any dual will have its primal. Have you done primal and dual? Have you done primal and dual model before in your linear programming class? Yes, please. Undergrads, did you do that? No, sir. No, please. Okay, no, no problem. Okay, but no problem. That's why you only learn one. Okay. Now the key point is that you're yeah. introducing this one is what is known as the the, well, the one we shall look at will be the primer. <laughs>